Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the fourth quarter of 2012. This series is entitled Growing in Christ, and this particular lesson is number eight for November 24 of 2012. It's entitled The Church in Service to Humanity. We'd like you to grab your Bible and join us as we study various verses on this subject. But first of all, we'd like to invite you to bow your heads with us as we begin with prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we ask that you will be especially close to us in guiding us as we study these verses, these passages, so that we may come to know you better, that we may come to recognize exactly what role the church is supposed to play in the final events of this history and what role we can play in being a part of that church organization and group. May that time come soon and may we soon be a part of us is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In this lesson, we will discuss the role of the church and how the church is to grow by fulfilling God's purpose for it. What does the church mean to you? How's that for a straightforward question? Are you, are you asking the Seventh-day Adventist Church or the Church in Christ? That's why I left it completely open. What does the Church mean to you? Do we need the Church? Yes. Yes. Well, look at 1 Peter 2.9. It's a sort of a um, main part of this uh, passage here. See if I can get my computer to behave like it's supposed to once again. There we go. Okay, let's try this again. First Peter 2 9. Come on, you can do better than that. There we go. But you are boy, it's really in a hurry today. But you are the chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation. God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous light. Now, if you're reading your King James Bible, it will say we are a peculiar people. Do you like being peculiar? Depends upon the definition of peculiar. Depends upon the definition of peculiar. Okay, what definition do you want to give it? Special? Yes. <laughs> um, well, even special can have bad connotations. Yeah. Yeah. You are a special and guy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, wife. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And depends upon perhaps the crowd that you're with at the time that it's said. Well, special in this me, in this case, the, the Greek word here implies a very special private possession, something you really prize. So that's what this is talking about. God prizes us. Remember that Luke tells us, Luke chapter 15, that what happens when we join God's side? There's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just people who don't need any repentance, right? So we are called to be that kind of people. Is there anyone who doesn't need repentance? No. So those 99 are fictitious? <laughs> no, those are people who think they don't need repentance. Oh. Well, look at an, an interesting passage in the Old Testament. Is this God's special people thing just apply to Christians? Look at Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own people. The whole earth is mine, but you will be my chosen people people dedicated to me alone who will serve me as priests. Does that sound a little like 1 Peter 2.9? And here it's talking about what group? Israel. Israel. Look at Deuteronomy 7 verse 6. Do this because you belong to the Lord your God. From all the peoples on earth he chose you to be his own special people. I selected three definitions, well, three for the church. Uh, a church is a building in which Christians meet for worship. A church is a group of Christians who gather for religious purposes. A church is a club for insiders and hypocrites. 
but th <laughs> those are the ones people usually associate with. But I think a church is a place where you get educated. It offers religious and moral uh, education. It seeks to transform people's minds, hearts, and lives, and it seeks uh, to join people together in life-changing communities. Great. Well, look at Deuteronomy 14, too. One more comment about God's special people. You belong to the Lord, your God. He has chosen you to be his own people from, all, from among all the peoples who live on earth. So, once again, of course, he was talking about the children of Israel at that point in time. When Jesus had finished his work after being crucified and rising from the grave, and as he was ready to ascend to heaven, he instructed his disciples to do what? Remember the verse, Matthew 28, two verses at Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Go then, that's his first instruction, go to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. That's the second thing. Baptize them, that would be the third thing, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That would require some education, wouldn't it? And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you and I will be with you always to the end of the age. So that's pretty clear instructions from Jesus, wouldn't you say? Yes. How successful have we been in doing that? Not. Not? Why do you say that? Because we're still here. 2,000 years later, we're still here. Well, in his prayer, just before his crucifixion, Jesus himself said that the goal is for us to be one with him as he is one with the Father. Uh, look at those words, John 17, verse 20 and 21. I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. Now, who would that include? How many of us believe in God because of the message of apostles and prophets? All of us. All of us, yeah. I pray that they may all be one, Father. May they be in us just as we are in, just as you are in me and I am in you. Have you thought about what it would be like to be so close to Christ that you're just as close to Christ as Christ is to the Father? What does that imply? I didn't understand it, but I should tell my mom, God is in my DNA and in my, <laughs> Jesus is in all my cells. Now, this was his very last prayer mm -hmm. on earth. Well, right. no, it wasn't. It's the last prayer that we, that we know any, have any details of. He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Well, I shouldn't say that either, because what did he pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? Well, this was let, this let this cup pass from me. That was even later than this one. But this, but this was uh, on the cross? I no, no. no. This, this was on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. Oh, okay. And, of course, some would say his last prayer were... Right. His last prayer was, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. True. So, if this, does becoming so close to Jesus that we are as close to him as he is to the Father, does that seem like an impossible goal? I think it's a continuous goal. There's no we never, on we never get there. We just keep moving closer? Well, that, what's the eternity for? Yeah. What would happen if we could accomplish that goal? Then we would be God. It would be very powerful. Mm -hmm. We would be God. I would say we'd still be one. Finite. We'd be one with God. We'd still be, yeah, in we'd, spirit. Mm -hmm. Sure, we'd be close to Him. We're still well, not going to become. That, him, I'm coming from the side that this is a continuous thing. Yeah. So that's why I say that. Yeah. Now, if you're saying that there, this is something that we can obtain right now, then you're looking at it different than I am. Well. It has always been, if this has always been God's goal, let's assume that, because we have those Old Testament passages, we have the New Testament passage. If this has always been God's goal, how successful has he been? He started out with Adam and Eve. Soon, he used a flood to drown the whole world except for eight people. He started over with Noah. Soon, he had to confuse the languages at the Tower of Babel. Not long thereafter, he had to start over by calling Abraham out of Ur to go to Haran and then on to Palestine later. After some 1,800 years, he made his last appeal to those people and then had to turn to the newly established Christian church. 
and then had to turn to, I'm sorry, working to his small group of disciples. Working under very difficult circumstances, that, that group grew very rapidly until it was made the official church of the Roman Empire. And then what happened? It fell into bad times. Finally, God made the Bible available in the languages of Europe through the efforts of Martin Luther, William Tyndale, and others. And the Protestant Reformation took hold. And it looked like phew, the gospel was spreading across the world. But 300 years later, God decided it was necessary to call a group from among those Protestant churches to form what we call the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Based on that history, does it seem likely that our chances, uh, do our chances for success, success seem likely or very limited? So are you saying that God's failing? I'm just, I'm looking at the facts. We're looking at the facts. We're still here on this earth. Well, maybe there is, is a I'm, reason we're still here on this earth. There is a yeah, reason. Absolutely. There is still a reason, yeah. And um, what could that be? Well, what is the ultimate role of the church in the world? Is it supposed to be a private club for saints? Yoli was talking about that. No. It's to tell our role, the church's role is to tell the world the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, let them know that he's coming, that he's uh, won the battle against Satan. Salvation is won, it's a free gift. Would you say that's a hospital for sinners? Yes. The church, yes. Well, Ellen White put it in these words. This is from a document she wrote in November 22 of 1902. You can find it today in Volume 2 of Selected Messages, page 396, paragraph 2. We should remember that the church, enfeebled and effective though it be, is the only object on earth on which Christ bestows his supreme regard. Did she think the church was perfect? No. Not at all. He is constantly watching it with solicitude and is strengthening it, strengthening it by his Holy Spirit. Now, has that always been true? What do you think? I'd say yes. Yeah. And that you could say that statement all the way back from the Israelites. Probably. So, what's happening here? Because well, I, it doesn't seem like God's getting anywhere. Uh, my next so statement... Is he, in, is he not successful? Yeah, is he, I think he is. Seems like he's not successful. Well, it seems like it, but I and think yet, he is. And yet, <laughs> he's I won the great controversy, but we're still here. And there I are millions... And there are millions of people who do believe, and we all believe, we're all struggling, we're all, but the Lord, as, as was mentioned here in this text, the Lord is working with us and strengthening us. And well, it has always been God's hope that his special people would take the task of representing him, I should say correctly, to the world, and they should take that task seriously and thus have a major impact on the entire world. That's always been God's plan. Why did God put the children of Israel in Palestine at the center of the then known world? So they could spread the gospel around. Did they do it? No. Well, Yoli asked us a question earlier that, that I would like to expand upon. How does the New Testament define church? When the Jews came together as a group to worship, they called it a what? A synagogue. What does synagogue mean? Coming together. A coming together. In Latin, that would be a congregation. Coming together. But that is not the word the New Testament uses for God's people. They are called an ecclesia. What's an ecclesia? Those are people who are called out or called forth to be God's special people. Remember, that was always God's hope for his people. And you remember the verses we read from Exodus 19. Today we use the word church in many ways. We say church meaning the building where we meet each Sabbath. Did you go to church last Sabbath? Okay. We even say church referring to the worship service which follows Sabbath school. I'm, 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 Sabbath school is finished, I'm going to church, right? We say church referring to the local congregation. Our church is having a potluck, right? We sometimes use church to refer to the organization, particularly the general conference. 
the church has decided, da, da, da. Okay? That's the general conference. It might even be the general conference in session. We have general conferences every five years. The church has decided. And we refer to the Seventh-day Adventist denomination as our church to distinguish it from other church groups. So when we use the word church, we need to be careful to designate what we mean by that term. And there are other ways in which church is used as well. So the Bible describes the church as the people of God. Exodus 19, 1 Peter 2, Deuteronomy 14, we've already looked at those verses. The church belongs to Christ, and if you truly belong to Christ, you are a descendant of Abraham. Look at that, Galatians 3.29. If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham, and you will receive what God has promised. And what kind of discrimination is there in that? Look at the preceding verse, Genesis 3.28. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and free people, between men and women. You are all in union with Christ Jesus. And why did Paul use that particular set of expressions, do you think? There's a famous recorded Jewish male prayer that went something like this. Lord, when we got up in the morning, I thank you that I'm not a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. And Paul, I'm sure, as a good Pharisee, had prayed that to prayer probably many times. And now he's giving a very different message, isn't he? I have a question. Yeah. So does the church mean the Seventh-day Adventist religion, or does it mean that the people, because many have been summoned, just like when uh, at the feast at the wedding, many people were invited, some came and some did not. Is it somebody's presence in church means that they've accepted Jesus, or is that final determination only, only God knows? Well, in light of the definitions of church we just mm -hmm. mentioned, it could be all of the above. However, however, when we use church to mean, and now I'm going to try to define it, the body of Christ, the people of God, then that's a very select group. And those are people who are seriously committed to being a part of God's people. Look at some verses that would describe that. Look at Romans 12, verse 5. In the same way, though we are many, we are one body in union with Christ, and we are all joined to each other as different parts of one body. And it goes on to describe the, uh, the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives. And look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27. All of you are Christ's body and each one is a part of it, okay? And look at Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. And how very great is his power at work in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at his right side in the heavenly world. Christ rules there above all heavenly rulers, authorities, powers, and lords, as a title superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next, God put all things under Christ's feet and gave them to the church as supreme, gave him to the church as supreme Lord over all things. The church is Christ's body, the completion of him who himself completes all things everywhere. That's a pretty comprehensive statement, isn't it? Well, Paul went to considerable length to describe how the different parts of the body are made, and you're familiar with these passages, how the different parts of the body are made to work together just as the different members of the church are to form one body. You know, we can't all be ears, we can't all be eyes, we can't all be noses, we can't all be feet, we can't all be hands, but if we all play the role that God has given us and we come together as a unified church, what happens? The church moves forward, right? Thus we see that the church also means mission. The church is not just a place where we go to worship once a week. Jesus made it clear that we are to go. To do what? Go, make disciples, baptize, and teach all things to new believers. Even the names that are used for God's special individuals down through history imply that kind of mission. Apostles are people who are sent out to do a mission. Apo means to go, Stella means to send, to go forth or to be sent forth. Uh, 
The Latin word equivalent of apostle is missionary. Prophets are people who speak for God as ambassadors. Pro means on behalf of or for. Femi is a Greek word which means to speak, someone who speaks on behalf of someone else as an ambassador. Do we think of ourselves, every one of us, do you think of yourself as a spokesperson for God? That's what a prophet is. I have a question about that yeah. where it says uh, make disciples and teach. Uh, that isn't just talking about a, per a person in leadership, is it? No. So it, could, it, could a, uh, a lay person baptize? Well, certainly that happened in, in New Testament times. We so it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be wrong? No. Okay. From the day that your ancestors... Now, I'm looking at some places in, where, where the Bible talks about this in the Bible. I mean, the, the God talks about this through the Bible. Jeremiah uh, 7.25. From the day that your ancestors came out of Egypt until this very day, I have kept on sending my servants, the prophets, to you. So God has been always trying to reach us. Look at Luke 9, the first two verses. Jesus called the 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and cure diseases. Then he sent them out. What are people called who are sent forth? Ambassador. Apostles, right? He sent them out to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick and so forth. Okay? It sounds like uh, an apostle is one that intelligently goes out yeah. and, and is able to teach because he understands. Mm -hmm. um, possibly a prophet may be more of a mouthpiece for God, may not completely understand what he's saying, mm -hmm. but um, he's speaking for God. There's a very important passage here in, in the Bible that I'd like us to look at to try to summarize some of this. It's found in Ephesians chapter 4. And we really ought to start with verse 9. Well, we should start with verse 7. Each one of us has received a special gift in proportion to what Christ has given. As the scripture says, when he went up to the very heights, he took many captives with him. He gave gifts to people. Now, what does he went up mean? It means that first he came down to the lowest depths of the earth, down so he could associate with who? With us, right? So the one who came down is the same one who went up above and beyond the heavens to fill the whole universe with his presence. It was he who gave gifts. He appointed some to be, there we have it, apostles, others to be prophets, there we have it again, others to be evangelists, others to be pastors and teachers. He did this. Now what's the purpose of all of this? He did this to prepare all God's people for the work of Christian service in order to build up the body of Christ. And so we all, so we shall all come together to that oneness in our faith and in our knowledge of the Son of God. We shall become mature people reaching to the very height of Christ's full stature. Reaching where? To the very height of Christ's full stature. Do we have any kind of a notion even of what that means? Dr. Hart, does that word mature means, I don't know, if it means in the Greek perfect? Well, it's sometimes translated as perfect, yes. The word means mature. Okay, in, in that context. Well, yeah, well, in, in, in whenever it's used, basically. Because Teleos is the word. There's a verse where it says, uh, be, like, be, be perfect like... Your the, Father in heaven is perfect. Yeah, yeah that word means what? But that was means, never mind. But that means mean mature. It means mature in that okay. context. Yes, it does. Okay. Thank you. Well, how do we get to be built up to the full stature of Christ? The very height of Christ's full stature, as my version says. Yes. If we are sealed, would that help? What does it mean to be sealed? Well, you won't be, you won't be taken away. Okay. But you don't necessarily know everything, do you? No. I, I would something. say you're very, you're very loyal. Your loyalty is there. There's a statement that says, "So settled it in the truth that you can't be moved." Intellectually and spiritually. And spiritually. Yeah, that's 
Volume 4, the Bible Commentary, the SD Bible Commentary, page 1161, paragraph 6. That's, of course, words from Ellen White. Any organism that does not grow is dead. The same could be said of the church. There are many things to which the church could address itself. There are many problems in society which call for social reform. But we have one central focus, and that is to prepare a people, especially preparing ourselves, for the second coming of Christ. How involved are we as a church or as a Sabbath school class in this major challenge? Do we think that's just as important a part, or maybe a more important part of our work each week as earning a living? Supporting a family? Are those, do we ever let the necessary take precedence over the important? The, the urgent. Difference is. <laughs> the and the definition, sometimes our definitions seem to be mixed up a little bit. Yeah. The urgent. You've got to do this right now. Okay. Other is more important, but you've got to do this right now, right? Well, just as the body has diverse parts, but it all works together, diversity will always be present in the church. Nevertheless, the church is to be united in its mission. We are to be the people of God, the body of Christ, the temple of the Holy Spirit. Here we are, all three members of the Godhead, right? Those of us who have been in the church longer are to help newer members. And it talks all about that in Romans 14 and 15. Look at 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. By the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, I appeal to all of you, my brothers and sisters, to agree in what you say so that there will be no divisions among you. Be completely united with, one, with only one thought and one purpose. Is that possible in a diverse church? Well, look at 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11. This should be a very familiar passage. And now, brothers and sisters, goodbye. Strive for perfection. Listen to my appeals, agree with one another, live in peace, and the God of love and peace be with you. Dr. Hart, regarding the dead organism, mm -hmm. an organism may look dormant, but if you add something to it, depending on what you yeah. add to it, it can grow and yeah. become something else. If it's the Holy Spirit, if it's good thing, okay, it bears good fruit, but it's not always... Mm -hmm. <laughs> And if it's something bad, we always speak about the Holy Spirit, but there's a, also another spirit almost always present that we ignore quite a bit. But if you get that other spirit, you know, you get fruits too, but not good ones. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Are you asking a question of whether or not there's life in a seed? <laughs> yeah. Well, none of us can carry out the, all the work of the church by ourselves. Now, there's some people feel like nobody else can do it the way they do it, so they would almost like to do that, but we need to be a part of a larger group. And that means we're not always going to agree about everything, by definition. So how do we get diverse peoples to work together as a, in, in unity? Well, the only solution I know is to have the love of God learned and practiced in our own lives. In any group that is to accomplish a goal of any sort, there must be some kind of organization and ultimately some person or group or, of persons have to be in charge. Oh boy. So what happens if you have people in charge? They start being bossy. They start being <laughs> bossy. The unity oh has dear. a tendency to get ununified. I see. Well, the Seventh-day Adventist Church has what we describe as a representative sort of or system of church governance. Uh, these church representatives are supposed to follow the plan set forth by God in Scripture in guiding and directing the church. Do we have that spelled out in Scripture? Well, it's very interesting to look at Acts 15. Open your Bibles there because you may think that I... I'm reading something that couldn't possibly be in the Bible in a couple of places here. So open your Bible and follow along. Again, I'm reading from the Good News Bible. Yours may be a little bit different, but the message ought to be the same. Acts 15. Some men came from Judea to Antioch. Now let's back up a second. Where are we in the story here? 
The church in Antioch is growing like wildfire. And who's active there? Barnabas and Paul. Paul and others that we don't know the names of. So the church is just exploding in growth. And what happens when the church, a church is exploding in growth somewhere? The General Conference wants to know what's going on over there, right? <laughs> By the so, way, where is Antioch? Antioch is in Syria. Current day Syria? Current day Syria. This Antioch. There were, there's more than one Antioch, but this one. Historically, there have been a lot of Christian. In fact, that's where yeah. the Christian church really started, wasn't it? It was a major headquarters for the church for a long time. Right now, they're driving a lot of them out of there. Yep. Well, some, some men came from Judea. That would be, what's the headquarters of Judea? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. That would be the headquarters of the church. Some people came from the headquarters of the church to Antioch and started teaching the believers you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised as the law of Moses requires. Guess what happened? Paul and Barnabas got into a fierce argument with them about this. So it was decided that Paul and Barnabas and some of the others in Antioch should go to Jerusalem, not specifically mentioned Jerusalem, and see the apostles and elders about this matter. So who do you suppose were the apostles and elders that were in charge at that point in time? Perhaps James. James, Peter, Peter, John. They could be wrong. Hold on, you're getting ahead of the story. <laughs> sometimes the message, sometimes the message is different. Yeah, but many people have differences of opinions. Well, they were sent on their way by the church, and as they went through Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported how the Gentiles had turned to God and so forth. And we drop down to verse 5. But some of the believers who belong to the party of the Pharisees, who are these people? <laughs> people who had been Pharisees in the Jewish religion. And what are they and now? They became converted to Christianity. And what did they, they want to They still held happen? on to their, many of their traditions. Pharisaical beliefs. Now we have a group of Pharisees who have become Christians. And what is their goal? They want the Christian church to be a subgroup of Phariseeism, right? They were the learned. They were the, the smart ones. They were also the circumcised ones and the ones with lots and lots of rules and regulations. Do we have some names of these, by the way, from history? Was it, yeah. Uh, well, Paul was a Pharisee. Well, Paul was a Pharisee. Joseph of Arimathea. Joseph of Arimathea. Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Simon. Simon, yes. And probably Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, because they were related to Simon. Well, when they arrived in Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles and elders, to whom they told all that God had done with, for, to them. But some of the believers who belonged to the part of the Pharisees, we already looked at this, stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and told to obey the law of Moses. And of course, they had a million attachments to that law of Moses. Well, I'm not, I don't have time to read the whole thing. If you go down, they had a big, long discussion, and they listened to Paul's report and so forth. And finally, we get down to verse 19, and apparently the leader of the group stood up. It is my opinion, James went on, that we should not trouble the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write a letter telling them not to eat any food that is ritually unclean because it has been offered to idols, to keep themselves from sexual immorality, and not to eat any animal that has been strangled or any blood. Now, is this a new version of the gospel? Pretty different if it is. Yeah, it's pretty different if, if it is. So, what is this? Hmm? How to get along with yeah. with uh, the, how, how the Jews and the Gentiles can get along together, sit in the same church, you, eat at the same potluck, and you, and you mean not. There might be trouble getting along in the church. <laughs> how could you talk, suggest such a thing? Well, this is what happens. Basically, these Pharisees were saying, "We're not even gonna, we're not even willing to sit down beside a Gentile unless he observes at least these things." Okay, so the conclusion was, starting with verse 8, the Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you besides these necessary rules. Who has agreed on them? 
the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit and us, right? Eat no food that has been offered to idols, eat no blood, eat no animal that has been strangled, and keep yourselves from sexual immorality. You will do well if you take care not to do these things with our best wishes. And of course, they were sent off. And what was the conclusion? Well, I, the Holy Spirit and us, mm -hmm. how, how can that be put together like that? I thought when people this is do inspired things right, scripture. <laughs> when people do things right, they do things according to the Holy Spirit, not yeah. the Holy Spirit and us. I mean, it's just like we're giving us some authority. There, yeah, no? giving us some authority with the Holy Spirit. You know, when when we it, it's like saying we the church got together and prayed for the Holy Spirit. And so it's the Holy Spirit and we came to this conclusion. We okay. with the Holy Spirit's <laughs> blessing came to this conclusion. Well, what had they decided? They had decided that there were a multitude of Pharisaical rules that they were willing to sort of set aside, which is quite remarkable. Really, it is quite remarkable. They said, no, you don't have to obey all those rules, but there are these ones where we really, really think are absolutely essential, right? The ones they had the most problem with. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, no, circumcision. they didn't, they they didn't well, mention common. circumcision. They didn't mention <laughs> circumcision. Yeah. Well, this general conference committee, if we dare to call it that, meeting in Jerusalem, decided that not all Jewish rules needed to be followed, but that it was necessary to avoid eating meat offered to idols. That was one of the four things. However, when Paul returned to the distant fields of Corinth and riding on to his friends in Rome, and you can read all about that in Romans 14 and 1 Corinthians 8 and 10, what happened? He made it clear that the ceremonial restrictions that he had once thought were so important because he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, wasn't he? No longer applied to Christians. This brought him into, and that would include this ceremonial restriction of not eating food offered to idols. This brought Paul into conflict with church leadership, and ultimately, if you read Acts of the Apostles, starting from about page about 397 over to page 405, ultimately resulted in his imprisonment. That's Paul's imprisonment in Jerusalem and spending most of the rest of his life in prison. Ellen White suggested that in this case, Paul was right and church leadership was wrong. Oh dear. And that Paul should not have compromised with church leaders. But certainly that's wow. the only time that church leadership has been wrong. Of course. Yes. And how are they going to, if those church leaders were truly good people and they're going to be in heaven, how is Paul going to sit next to them in church? You're going to say, thank you for all the wonderful things you did for me? Yeah. Well, the best teachers and the best church leaders, and I hope those church leaders were gracious enough to visit Paul in prison. We have no record of it, but I hope it was true. He was imprisoned not far from Jerusalem for two years. Well, the best teachers and the best church leaders are always those who are servant leaders. True Christians will humbly perform whatever task is given them and will perform it with an attitude of love. They won't say, I'm not going to serve unless I can be head elder. But what happens if someone believes that she or he knows better and can perform better than all others and therefore should be leader of a local church or even a larger group? Do we have any directions about what we should do in such a case? Ellen White had these interesting words to say in Testimonies to Ministers, Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 361, 362, paragraph 1. The spirit of domination is extending to the presidents of our conferences. Uh oh. If a man is sanguine of his own powers and seeks to exercise dominion over his brethren, feeling that he is invested with authority to make his will the ruling power, the best and only safe course is to remove him. The uh, less great harm be done and he lose his own soul and imperil the souls of others. All ye are brethren. 
This disposition to lord it over God's heritage will cause a reaction unless these men change their course. Those in authority should manifest the spirit of Christ. They should deal as he would deal with every case that requires attention. They should go weighted with the Holy Spirit. A man's position does not make him one jot or tittle greater in the sight of God. It is character alone that God values. Is this, is this saying that church leaders were not only wrong in Paul's time, but in Ellen White's time? <laughs> How could that be? That's twice. And there was a time during the Middle Ages, we call it the Dark Ages, when the church was almost dominant over everything. Why do we call it the Dark Ages? <laughs> well, that's pretty scary language. How successful has the church been in accomplishing the goal that Christ gave us? The simple answer is what? We're still here, right? Jesus explained why this is, this is in his parable of the wheat and the tares. You remember Matthew 13, starting with verse 24. Jesus told them another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like this. A man sowed good seed in his field. One night when everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the plants grew and the ears of corn began to form, then the weeds showed up. The man's servants came to him and said, Sir, it was good seed you sowed in your field. Where did the weeds come from? It was some enemy who did this, he said. He answered, Do you want us to go and pull up the weeds? They asked him, No, he answered, because as you gather the weeds, you might pull up some of the wheat along with them. Let the wheat and the weeds both grow together until harvest. Let the wheat, I'm sorry, then I will tell the harvest workers to pull up the weeds first, tie them in bundles and burn them, and then to gather in the wheat and put it in my barn. So are we supposed to go around saying, you don't belong, you don't belong, yank you out? Well, if you have differences of opinions in the same organization, it makes the stronger ones get stronger, and hopefully maybe some of the others will, but many of them will just keep going their own path. But if, yeah. you, if, you, if you have, don't have any controversy, thinking has probably stopped. Mm. Growth has probably wow. stopped. Wow. Well, I'm not, so it, we're saying does it make sense? Or <laughs> it hasn't yes. worked because there's weeds growing all the time. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the church, you know, your first question that, you know, the Lord hasn't come yet, it's because the weeds are growing with us. And if you're having problems, it's because the devil's probably after this organization, and that means there must be some good ones there. Which of us are weeds? Well, it's, we're not going <laughs> <laughs> to take, take a vote on that this evening. Let's, let's not take a vote on that one, right? Okay, well. Said us. <laughs> yeah, what about that? Um, does sometimes the church seem like it's having a problem with some of the weeds? Do we ever need to take action? Are we told in the Bible that we need to take action to achieve our overall goals. Look at Titus 3 verses 10 and 11. Give at least two warnings to those who cause divisions and then have nothing more to do with them. You know that such people are corrupt and their sins prove that they are wrong. Wow. Now how do you know if a person is causing divisions? I mean there's a lot of prophets in the Bible who came back to Jerusalem or Israel, and you could point to them and say that they were causing the divisions. And they killed them. Yeah, and they killed them. So they did what they did away with the division causers. Have you ever seen a <laughs> modern church be split down the middle by someone coming in with a message of some kind or yes. an issue of some kind? Yes, I have. I okay. have. I truly have. And, and what do we say about that? Well, that's my question. Well, Paul says in another place, Romans 16, 17, I urge you, my brothers and sisters, watch out for those who cause divisions and upset people's faith and go against the teaching which you have received. Keep away from them. And I, all of us here presumably are fairly familiar with what Paul managed to say over in, in Galatians chapter 1. What did he say about 
the truth of the gospel. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel that is different than the one we preach to you, may he be condemned to hell. Oh, dear. Okay, somebody's going to have to make that judgment if it's different than the one we've been preaching. We have said it before, and now I say it again. If anyone preaches to you a gospel that is different from the one you accepted, may he be condemned to hell. Wasn't he uh, putting that with the circumcision situation as well? Because well, salvation is mm -hmm. by faith and faith alone, and not by works and not by all this other stuff. It's very interesting that uh, the same, about the same time, um, Paul said these words in Romans 14, verse 5. Some people think that a certain day is more important than other days. Do we think that a certain day is more important than other days? Yes. We do. While others think that all days are the same, we should each firmly make up our own minds. Did Paul make, firmly make up his mind about the gospel? Absolutely. Yes. You better believe it. And should we firmly... Day. Huh? <clears throat> and about the day. Should we firmly make up our minds? Yes. Absolutely. But he's not really saying there, make it up the way I've made it up. He's just saying, let if he everybody says, be if freely. If gospel doesn't agree with the one I already preached to you, may be condemned to hell. That sounds pretty firm to me. Well, and okay, that one may have a different context than the other one you're, you're reading there, where let everyone be persuaded in his own mind. Well, I, I'm just saying that Paul wrote these two things within a few days of each you other. You have to understand the contents of right? context of them both. That's you can't just put them together and say, hey, there's a contradiction here. Oh, no, I don't think there's a contradiction. <laughs> well, some people can do that. They can just we put it together. We absolutely need to be fully convinced of everything that we believe. Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I, I don't know why yeah. it says if you are tipid, I would throw you out. Yeah, if you're, uh, yeah, you have to be yes yeah, Paul, or no. Paul wrote Hebrews. We right? believe, and that that's some. Pr if if you really read it and think about it, that's some pretty strong language. The first four chapters mm -hmm. seems to me that the first four chapters are all about the Sabbath, mm -hmm. and it becomes well, it's about Christ and about his position in chapter. heaven, and then the sure. fact that he's superior to all these other things, sure. and that he's given us a Sabbath as a rest. So Paul, Paul made a decision regarding the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful, you know, in other mm -hmm. writings. We have it in the Ten Commandments. Yes. God gave us that. You know, I, I think there's, there's really two things that cause division in the church. One is a heretical idea. Mm -hmm. The other one is intolerance. Yeah. So you've got these both. And... Um, I mean, you may have somebody coming into the church with actually a message from God, and people could be intolerant and cause division that way. Look or you may have a Paul. guy. You may have a guy come in that um, is coming up with a weird idea that may be satanic, and he could cause division. How should we deal with people who come to a church and they have their own new pet idea and? when they, the church maybe doesn't accept their pet idea, they decide to separate themselves. Start their new ministry. Well, they've taken care of the problem, haven't they? They've left. <laughs> <laughs> the church is never the private property of any individual. One person has described the issue of how to deal with problems in the church as follows. You can't clean a house from the outside. Where do you have to be if you want to do something about problems in the church? You got to be in there. So what you're saying is don't give up, don't run away, stay and clean the house if the cl if in fact the house needs to be cleaned, but do it in a spirit of love. I'm I'm always reminded That's the hardest you know, part. That's the hard <laughs> part. That's the hard part. Yeah. Cuz you feel like <laughs> <laughs> that, that was supposedly the view of the Puritans as yes. opposed to the separatists back yes. in the old times. There, there are many people who think that they shouldn't give their money to the church because the church is misusing it. And when someone says that to me, I say, you know, Jesus talked about giving money to the church one time, didn't he? A, a, a widow came in. She had two tiny little copper coins. 
and she was afraid to even put them in the offering plate. She didn't want to see. She didn't want to see how little she had. But, and it was all she had. And so when, no, when she thought nobody was looking, she put in her two little copper coins. And Jesus said she's given more than anyone else. Now, the interesting thing that we, pro we don't often follow through on this is where was that money going to go? It it's seemed a corrupt yes, system. To a very corrupt bunch of individuals, primarily the Sadducees. What do you suppose they would have done with those two tiny little copper coins? Probably. I mean, they were, they were, they were looking for gold coins. They're not looking for tiny little copper coins. So Jesus is telling us it's our responsibility to faithfully give our money to support the church. Now, if we think the church is misusing our money, then there are other ways to deal with that issue. That does not give us permission to stop supporting the church. Well, have there been times when we've had problems in, even in the Seventh-day Adventist church? Well, probably almost everyone has heard of what happened in 1888. You can read about that in First Selected Messages, page 233 to 235, and she says there, the general conference in session, there were all 90, all 90 members of them there, actually turned off the latter rain on that occasion. A much less familiar church meeting was held in 1919, four years after Ellen White was dead. And what did they discuss? They discussed how we should relate to the writings of a modern prophet. How should we deal with them and how should we, should we regard them as equal with the Bible? And they had a long conference and they came up with some very interesting guidelines about how we should deal with inspiration. And they all said, yeah, we need to go home and we need to, we need to teach our people this message about dealing with inspiration. And they all went home and almost none of them said anything. Well, so what was it that they were, that they decided that they were supposed to say and didn't say? They were supposed to talk about the various aspects of inspiration and the fact that the people who were inspired were not, not, these are not like God's words just sort of flowing through a prophet, that the prophet was an individual and they express things in their own terms and so forth. All of those things that many church members still have not accepted. Isn't the preface to Great Controversy a, a pretty good statement? Of, the preface uh, about, about, to Great Controversy about, about is how very inspiration good were, uh, one of the best. An excellent statement, yes. Um, well, anyway, um, we have been told repeatedly that Christ is to be the head of the church, the chief cornerstone, etc. You know, um, and, and let's just look at those verses real quick. Look at Ephesians, excuse me, Ephesians 2 starting with verse 20. You too are built upon the foundation laid by the apostles and prophets, the cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself. Amen. Now our Roman Catholic friends will tell us that the church is built on Peter. <laughs> and we sometimes have tried all sorts of very technical ways to say no, no it's not built on Peter. We should read this verse and say, yes, the church is built on Peter and it's built on all the rest of the apostles. It's built on all the prophets. It's built on the scriptures that those apostles and prophets have given us, given us. In fact, it's supposed to be built on us. We're supposed to be a part of the building. Look what Paul says right here. In union with him, you too are being built together with all the others into a place where God lives through his spirit. That's the way the church should really be. So what is implied by this idea? The church is not only a place for individuals to belong, but it's also a group organization. If we are to take our task seriously, we should be preparing people as quickly as we can for the second coming of Jesus Christ. New members who enter the church give new life to the whole group. Those of you who have belonged to a church that's really on fire and you see new members coming in, you know that this is true. Those new members, however, need to be nurtured one-on-one, -on -one, so as to become true disciples. This means teaching them the importance of Bible study as well as methods that can be used for Bible study. And as we've said on this program before, we have study guides for the Bible that are specifically for that kind of, of study to take place. You can find them on our website at Theox, that's T-H-E-O-X, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G, 
and there's study guides there for almost every book of the Bible. Unfortunately, the church has had problems retaining not only new members, but also even our own young people. Why do you think that is? Well, we've already looked at Ephesians chapter 4, but go back and look at it again. Paul says, the purpose of the gifts of the Spirit, making some apostles and prophets, etc., is to build up a strong church that, though it's diverse, is moving forward to accomplish the goal. And the goal is what? To prepare a people that can't be shaken, not tossed about by every wind of doctrine, but a people who are so settled into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, that they cannot be moved. Volume 4 of the Bible Commentary, 1161, uh, paragraph 6. That's the kind of people God is looking for to be a part of the 144,000. This is not a on and off, once a week kind of a process. It, to, be, to really disciple a new member, she or he should be taken under the wing of one or more church members and really brought into the family of God. A new member needs to be associated with others who are correctly practicing the principles of Seventh-day Adventist Christianity. This kind of change is caught and not just taught. Disciples, and I'm quoting from uh, a book, The Lost Art of Discipleship, Disciple Making, I'm sorry. Disciples cannot be mass produced. We cannot draw people into a program and see the disciples emerge at the end of the production line. It takes time to make disciples. It takes individual, personal attention. Are we prepared to take that kind of responsibility? If a new member comes into your church, do you put your arm around them and say, brother, sister, come to my home, let's talk, let's study the Bible together, let's get you on a solid foundation, and then let's, find, let's help you find others. If we're not prepared to take on that responsibility, are we going to leave it to future generations? Do we want to be responsible for further delaying the second coming of Jesus Christ? You know, Jesus himself said, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached to the whole world, and then the end will come. Are we doing our part? Do we have the gospel as clearly in mind as Paul did, Galatians 1? I certainly hope we do. It's a lot of work, but we can do it, and you can too. See you next week.